decision you made because there's another fellow out there that did the same thing you did, and it's the best compliment you can have. That holds true, too, with our programs, and that's what's happening to us is that everything we do, someone else comes and copies, but there's a difference. And from a bargaining standpoint, all of you need to know and understand that. Let's take last year at this time as an example. Nobody anticipated that the unorganized would hold their corn and beans, but more specifically corn, off the market in such an effective manner. We've taught everyone how to do that. And it was effective. The price rose. We all know the history of that. But we had a problem. We could see it coming. Though the unorganized can hold in an organized manner, they can't dispose of the production. They can't contract it in an organized manner. And just as soon as that started coming to market, we saw a reflection in the market itself. We saw it starting to drop. We started seeing great variances in it. And we told people that. We told other organizations. You may be able to do part of what we do, but you can't do the whole thing as we're geared up to do it. We're the only organization that can go nationwide and bargain on a nationwide basis for any of the commodities that we deal in. There is no other organization, and I defy any of you in here to give me that organization's name other than the National Farmers Organization. The amazing thing is we know we're right because as we go out with these programs, and let me give you an example, was the National Grain Block. As we went out with that, we started getting responses from individuals saying, well, I'm not going to sign up. I'm going to wait because we know that you're going to do that. We know you're going to raise that price. And the price was raised. And in fact, PIC came out of that. We knew there would be probably a counter reaction to what we were doing. It was there for various reasons, but it happened. It used to be when we went out that we had a terrible time convincing people we could do something. And for the older organizers in this room, you remember those days. Everyone says, you can't influence price. You can't have any effect on it because it's supply and demand. We don't have that problem today. And as they go out in the various uh, programs, the pilot program for the 450 corn and the $10 soybeans, the people were told, we know you can do it. We can't do it by ourselves. It takes everybody else to do it also. Last year, they followed our advice, and as I say, they held on the corn, but they could not dispose of it in an orderly manner. It's one thing that this organization can do and has done and, uh, very effective throughout the years and will continue to. The other area I want to get into for just a moment this morning, and we're having uh, difficulty with it, that's why I mention it. It is something that you've heard before, but I must mention it again because it directly relates to our ability to serve you people. And that has to do with shipments. This year, throughout and across the nation, not just necessarily one area, we have had problems with shipment in three categories. And I want to reinforce our position on that. The first one is condition that we're receiving grain in at terminals. We're having great difficulty with it because for some reason this year we're having a lot of bugs in the grain. People are not taking time to check the condition of that bin ahead of time. You're not doing a proper job of monitoring those bins and we're ending up with bug problems. And they are creating problems for us because then on a contract we cannot apply that grain because the buyer refuses to take it. Yet the truck is at some terminal and you don't want to pay transportation to have it returned to your farm or to someplace else, so then we have to do something with that truckload of grain. And we all suffer because of that. So even though you may not be guilty, certainly your neighbors are, and they need to be explained and have this explained to them how necessary it is to keep that grain in condition. And it doesn't matter whether it's wheat, corn, or soybeans. We're having problems in all of them. And when we get plugged at terminal, especially uh, in the lake regions, as everyone's trying to beat the closing and all that, you have serious problems. You have it other places, too. If we have a mill that we have developed a great relationship with, because of the quality we send to them and they produce flour under contract, they will not take buggy grain. It creates a serious problem for us. The next problem we have is still with shipments is quantity. 
we have a tremendous problem for some reason coming out on our quantity on our contracts. We're either over or under. Now, in years past, we used to have a tolerance with the trade. We had as high as a 10 percent tolerance. And they called me in one day, both in Minneapolis and in Portland, and wanted me to explain something to them. And it went like this. If we had a 10 percent tolerance on a contract and the market went above our contract, invariably we would deliver almost to the bushel, 10 percent less than what the contract called for. And yet, on the other hand, if the market went the other way, we would over deliver almost to the bushel, taking advantage of that price. So they said, would you please explain to us why it is that you can control that 10 percent so precisely. We maintain that if you can do that, you can sell to the bushel and deliver to the bushel. And people, we still have that problem today, whether we have the tolerance or not. So what the trade does is they roll those contracts on us. Now, it may not create a problem today or tomorrow, but here's when it does create a problem. And let's say that the market's been going up in soybeans, as it did since around July 17th for a period of time. And so everyone delivers just a little short on a contract. The trade is filling each one of those contracts to the bushel, because the way they do it is we have a series of contracts with them. And if we're short 100 bushels on this last contract, as the next member is allocated and delivers what he thinks is on the newer contract, 100 bushels is applied on the old contract and it's cleaned up, okay? But now we've got a problem, haven't we? Because there's a difference in price. This puts a burden on the trust. It puts a burden on bargaining because we have to go back and justify and clear up every one of these contracts. And we call it rollover. So quantity creates a problem for us. Now, where the real problem comes is let's go on with this thing. We have 50, 100, 150 contracts with, let's say, uh, uh, continental grain, and it's soybeans. I want to make it soybeans for a very special reason. And all of a sudden one day we realize we're short 15,000 bushels of soybeans. And the price differential is $3 a bushel. What kind of a problem have we got now? You see how it multiplies? It may only be two bushels from you and five from you and 25 from somebody else, but it creates a problem. So in the future, you're going to see us handling these sh shorts on allocation a little bit differently because we cannot expose ourselves and the rest of the membership to this type of situation. We have to take care of it. You can take care of it and we'll never have to deal with it if you'll deliver what you're supposed to deliver, not over or under. And I hear all the arguments, I've heard them for years, why you can or can't do it. But I'll come back to you and say it seems like when we had tolerances, we could still deliver within those tolerances almost to the bushel. All right, that's the second thing that we have with shipments. And the last one is timeliness. And you really wouldn't think you'd have to discuss that one. But we're out there bargaining for you and doing absolutely the best job but with them are hamstrung because we have a particular day when we can do something special in the market. But we can't do it because the buyer says, you're already late with 100,000 bushels of grain. Now, this, remember, we've had a little rollover here, so it's accumulated. What is going to convince me that within 15 days you can actually ship what I need here now? And if you can do that, why can't you take care of the rest of this? Do you see? how by not being timely with your shipments, how it hamstrings the bargainer and the bargaining section? Because what do we tell them? That's a pretty hard question to answer, isn't it? What do you tell the Continentals and the Cargills and the Dreyfuses and all the rest of them when you're trying to convince them of this new sale you're making that day? You really can't tell them much, can you? You say, well, it's going to be different today. You know, well, that's sort of like the checks in the mail, you know, one of the greatest lies there is. So those three things you have personal control over, and that is condition, quantity, and timeliness. And when you don't comply with those, you don't hurt me, you hurt yourself, and you hurt your neighbor. And it just makes it that much more difficult for us to do our job. We'll get it done, but who likes to make a job difficult, you know? 
I don't, and I know you don't either, and I know that if you know about it, you'll take care of it. So to wrap everything up, my function is to see that bargaining is coordinated. My function is to see that you people understand what we're doing with contracts and what our objectives are. My job is to see that the grain is handled in a timely manner. That's from a bargaining standpoint, that it's moved when it should be moved, regardless of the circumstance. Whatever you've told us, that's what we're going to do. So my job also is to work with the other divisions within grain. And you'll discover through our dissertation today that not only is there someone in charge of bargaining, there's someone in charge of procurement. In this case, it's Mark Rolfing. And Mark will be told from time to time that grain is not being signed up and blocked properly for us because we discovered we've had some situations that are incorrect. In other words, we have sold spring wheat that we thought was in the PIC program and discovered that it wasn't, it was new crop, and it's an entirely different picture then. We have to go back to the, the procurement people and say, now when you sign this up, make sure it's done properly. So all of those things are my functions. The next ones are is to develop new markets, new strategy. And I discussed this with the other bargainers and other departments. Grain does not stand by itself. It directly relates to whatever dairy is doing, to whatever livestock is doing, and what specialties are doing. Because what we do in soybeans affects sunflower prices, et cetera, et cetera. So another function is that we coordinate through that also. In doing all of this, and with your cooperation, we do the very best job that's available. And one of the reasons we do is that we have absolutely no vested interest in your grain. We do not take a position on it, so there is no reason why we should get a lesser market than what you deserve because we do not gain from that. We gain from good performance. That's the only thing we get and gain from in our division is good performance because we have no vested interest. Bear that in mind as you go out and discuss this with other members and also with non-members is that we're unique in that situation. We don't own the grain, we don't have a position in it, and therefore our best performance is our greatest reward. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. <clears throat> At this time, I'm going to take just a minute out here to brag a little bit about this staff that we have up here. I am a second generation NFO person, as Dave Schwerz is here, as a lot of the people in his staff in the entire organization are. But I think in grain, there's some special things that have occurred. Grain is the tough one. I've been in the hog department, in the field staff department, in the procurement department. Shelley's been in specialties. He's been in dairy. Uh, Dave worked for the trust. Roger's been in uh, hogs, in uh, field staff. We've, we've been around the block, and uh, I don't know, I, I guess all the departments were glad to get rid of us, you know, but, but we did gain some experience. And there is something different in grain. Grain, in, in milk, for instance, a guy's got milk, he's going to sell it. He's not going to keep it very long, he's going to sell it. In grain, you've got to do two things. You've got to cause people to sell grain when it's the time to sell it, and then you've got to get it sold properly. So it's really tough. I think this grain department has put together a lot of ideas from a lot of the other departments that I have to say at this point have been a little bit more successful than we have. That's not going to continue. I say that in introducing Dave Schwerz to you. Dave is a real special part of our department. Dave is a CPA, an accountant, and we all, and I more than anyone, have our little jokes about accountants. Dave's a little different than that. Dave worked for one of the big eight accounting firms. We're very lucky to have him. His family has always been involved in NFO, and Dave takes off at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or whenever we get done with work at the office, and he goes home and farms. Now, there's not a lot of accountants that do that. Dave takes care of the budgeting, as would be expected, 
in our department, but he does a lot of other things. He takes care of a lot of the things that are involved in making your grain handling work well. He understands the computerization of it. He understands how records need to be kept so not only they're accurate, but they're efficient and timely. He's also a great ideas man. He's involved in a lot of things uh, in the community, in politics. He happens to be on the other side of the aisle than I am, so I'm not going to brag on that too much. <laughs> but, but I want you to listen to Dave. I know he's going to tell you a lot of things that not only we're doing, but a lot of things that you can do to make our job easier and that we can do better to help you. Dave? Thank you, Mark. From that, it sounds like I'm running for something, but I'm really not, so. I just, uh, and we, I'm not going to tell you a lot of things because we've got to be brief because if we're going to get uh, divide up into groups and talk about these new contracts, we're going to have to move that direction. I did want to indicate uh, briefly that uh, the accounting system is changing with the decentralization. Uh, under the, uh, the board made the decision about uh, two years ago uh, to centralize the Midwest in the accounting. And that was done in Corning and the trust has performed that function. Under the decentralization plan that is now being implemented, the accounting will move back into the country. Now we've had the accounting in the offices in Great Falls, uh, Montana and Hanford, California and we, w we are on a schedule now to put the accounting back in the offices in Salina, Kansas, David City, Nebraska, West Fargo, North Dakota and Minster, Ohio. I am uh, a little conservative and I don't want when we transfer this accounting function. I don't want things to get all fouled up, so we're going to do one uh, office at a time, make sure that it's functioning properly, and then move to the next one. Because I don't think that anybody wants a giant mess somewhere because checks aren't getting out because the workload can't be handled. So uh, if you are wondering why the settlements are still being done in Corning for your particular area three months from now, I hope you'll remember that and take that into consideration. Another thing that I wanted to comment on, you know, we, uh, at times, we, we become very frustrated with the computer. Um, the computer is set up to do a certain thing. It's almost like a, a railroad, uh, like a train. Once it's set up, it's got to go down the track. The thing that we have to remember is, is that, you know, if we're going to be an organization that sometime in the future is, is moving 500 million, a billion, two billion bushels of grain, we have to have a system that can handle that volume. Now, we, can't, we can't have a system whereby we can treat each load of grain on a different type of contract and with different circumstances involved in the settlement. We have to have policies about overs and unders, uh, over and under deliveries, that, that the computer automatically treats them the same in each situation. Those are the types of things where a computer, once the policies are established, we can handle tremendous volumes uh, with relatively low cost, and that's the key. So I think that you know, when we, there's no doubt that with, with a hand accounting system, you have more flexibility on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not that you can't build the flexibility into a computer system, but that costs money. And it costs more, it's, it costs money in programming for the different variations that you have. So I hope that, you know, we are, we're trying to, to do the things that are necessary to handle the grain. Uh, we hope that if you have specific comments that you will talk to your regional office about things that can be improved. If you have questions about your payment, uh, talk to the regional office first, uh, the Grain Center. And if you uh, still have additional questions, why well, feel free to call us in the home office. 
just one other thing I wanted to comment on, and that is that uh, sometimes we use contracts in NFO over a long period of time, and we develop a concept of what that contract says and how it's been used in the past. And sometimes there a difference develops between what our concept of the contract is and what the language in the contract says. And I just wanted to make, to suggest to you that the contracts you use in the grain department, and there are various contracts that can be used, but from time to time, read the language on the contract. Because if you ever have some kind of a problem with a contract, with a grain shipment, the language in the contract is what's going to determine the outcome. Okay? In other words, it's not what, it's not what your neighbor thinks that contract means, it's what the language in the contract says. Okay? With that, I think I'll turn it back to, uh, to Mark uh, to divide up into the groups unless he has some more comments. So, thank you. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> okay, We've, uh, we were worried about filling the time, and it looks like the time has escaped us, as it always does. Um, okay. I'm going to ask the following people to stand. Uh, we will divide up into groups at this time. 